in Genesis, all the way back, chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to just kind of get through this quickly here. Verse 18. The Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals and birds of the sky and brought them to see what the man would call them and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. I think Adam was a little confused when he came to uh, bunny rabbits. He should have called them running bobbits. But he did. And butterfly should have been flutterbys. I think that would have been a much more accurate name, but he didn't listen to me. So that's the way it goes. The man gave name to all the livestock, the birds, the sky, all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. The first surgical operation. And no surgeon was present except for God. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and he closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord said, made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. And she's been in the pain of the sight of the man ever since. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's not what it says there. No, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe, man, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. I want to talk about marriage today. So let's get on with that. There we go. The four C's of a successful marriage. Wedding. <coughs> He's standing in front of the church and the minister as he walks down, as she walks down the aisle. And he is thinking, oh boy, this is the person that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. We will live happily ever after. And in two years, they're wondering why they ever married this impossible person. <laughs> we are annoyed by the divorce rate, especially among Christians. Even the divorced people don't like it. Because no one ever gets married to get divorced. That was not the game plan. Nope. We stood in front of the preacher. We stood in front of the crown. And we said, for better or worse, richer or poor, and sickness and in hell, till death do us part. So what is going on with marriages today? Now, I am going to vent a little righteous anger through this, and I hope that you can uh, 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 bear with it and hear the word of God and not blend. But what does it take to make a marriage last for a lifetime? Now, these are notes that I put together back when I was putting together a pre-marriage class. I declared early in my ministry, and I, I kind of did a little observing, and uh, declared early on, I will not marry a couple if I have not done some pre-marriage counseling with them prior to the event. Now, there's been a couple of times I've had to cram it in real fast because they were in a hurry or for whatever reason, and we have done that, but I like to take a few weeks and, and just kind of absorb this over time. I did have one situation where I started counseling with a couple, and they decided not to continue with the counseling because they decided they're not to get married. They just, uh, realized that maybe that they weren't as suited or committed as, as, as they need to be. So, the four seasons of a lasting marriage. The first one is commitment. Now I'm going to be running back and forth here to the scriptures a little bit. So let's go over to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Oh, I keep closing the app. I want to keep open. I'm going to have to train my fingers here. Okay. Thank you. Genesis 1, verse 27. It says, So God made mankind in His own image, in the image He created them, Male and female, he created them. Now that's one statement we want to remember. And then over in chapter 2, verse 24, where we were just a moment ago, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and he's united to his boyfriend. And No, 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 no. He's united to his wife. And the two become one flesh. Now, in Matthew, let's go down to Matthew 19, 
And the Pharisees are talking to Jesus and they're trying to say, well, is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus, the Son of God who came to earth and lived on this earth said, haven't you read that in the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So there will no longer be two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And then let's go to one more, and that is in Mark chapter 10, which is vir virtually Mark's account of the same thing, but we want to read it just because it's there. In Mark chapter 10, verse 6, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Being committed is giving 100%. Whether you think your mate is giving 100% or not. Commitment is not based on what the other person does. Commitment is based on what you are going to do. And you've heard a lot of people say, well, marriage is 100%, 100%. And so, it's not my obligation to make Sylvia give me 100%. It's my obligation to examine Glenn to see if he's giving Sylvia 100%. It begins with love. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. Many of you have read through this passage many a time, but again, this is review. For some of you, this is review. Some of you have been married longer than I have by a long shot. But you know what? You need some notes that you can take to your children. You need some notes you can share with your grandchildren. You younger people need to listen because this is God's Word. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 says, Love is patient. How many times have we been impatient with our spouse? <gasps> Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love does not dishonor others and it is not self-seeking. That's another thing that we need to pound in the uh, part of the word. But yeah, we need to pound, we need to grind, we need to establish very firmly in the heads of every married person in the world. Love is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, especially Sunday mornings on the way to church when you get in arguments with your spouse because you're too rattled because you're afraid you'll get to church on time. And then all of a sudden you get in church and you get the prettiest little smiles on your faces. Some of you have gotten past that, but you remember there have been those times. Love keeps no records of wrongs. Does not bring up the past when you're having those little oops, I told you so. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. And love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And verse 8 says, love never fails. Now you notice in this, just real quick before we go on, that there's nothing about the other party that's being loved. This is all that the person who's doing the loving does. And if you think about it one minute, this is exactly what God does for us. And this is what Jesus has done for us when He went to the cross to die for our sins. Goodness gracious, if Jesus can love us as ugly as I've been, and maybe some of you also, maybe He could love you, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. Another significant passage for us to look at. Ephesians 5. Now, I'm going to, yeah, verses uh, 25 through 29. I'm going to start actually with verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his own body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Verse 25 says, Husbands, <laughs> love your wives. It's interesting. The Bible doesn't tell the wife to love her husband. That seems to come a little more naturally. But sometimes those husbands need to be reminded. We need to love our wives. How? 
just as Christ loved the church. I could give you a whole sermon just on this passage talking about how Christ loved the church and comparing that to marriage, maybe another time. And he gave himself up for her to make her holy. Did she make herself holy? No, the husband made her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church. My wife is a radiant wife, not because she did it, but because I have chosen to present her to myself as a radiant wife without stain, without wrinkle, wrinkle without blemish, contrary to the years. You have got the beautiful, most beautiful face, the most beautiful skin in the whole wide world. And uh, if there are any imperfections, we are not going to notice and we're not going to talk because you are holy and blameless. And in the same way, the husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and they care for their body just as Christ does the church. And then let's go back to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. Matthew chapter 22, verse 39 says, This is the greatest, first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, now the story behind this is that Bob came over one time and, and he's having a little difficulty with uh, his Bobette. Or, or Bobby, or whatever his wife's name was. And so I remind him, well, the Bible tells you to love your wife. He said, have you seen my wife? Have you ever listened to her? She does this, and she does this, and she does this, and she does this. And I said, well, the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, but my wife is the most terrible neighbor I have ever imagined. Oh, why in the world would I ever want to love her? Well, then, okay, that's fine, Bob. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. And let's read verse 44. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus is speaking. He said, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, what excuse does Bob have? Is his, his wife his wife, his neighbor, or his enemy? What's the Bible tell us to do? Love them all. Love them all. That's right. And I'll tell you this before I go any further. If he'd love his wife like he loves his neighbor, his wife would be a better neighbor. Okay. Uh -oh. Marriage vows are for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health until death separates us. There is no condition. There are no escape clause. Marriage is for life. I talked to a, a couple... Some time ago, oh, come on now, let me think here. Got to think. Brain fade. Hang on, I'll get it back. <laughs> Richard poor. Oh, okay, yes, uh huh. They got married, life was just beautiful when they started out. Later on, he got into drugs. You think that marriage had problems? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Marriage started out just fine, uh, uh, but. Uh, he was looking at pornography and he got into sexual immorality. Think that marriage had problems? Mm -hmm. They started out, they both had good jobs, they were working just as happy as could be, and the economy popped and the jobs went down, and the next thing you know, they're unemployed and they're scraping from end to end. But you know, some of the happiest married couples I've seen couldn't rub two dimes together to go buy a, an ice cream cone. Well, it's two dollars together now. It's an ice cream cone isn't a dime anymore. <coughs> between the two of them to celebrate their wedding anniversary. But they are committed to each other. And so they make it work. Many a situation where the husband had a disability, Christopher Reeves, some you know, fell off a horse, broke his neck. How's he going to earn an income? The guy can't do a thing, but his wife still loved him and stayed by him until death did them part. I'm going to talk about Let's see, I've read those two already. I want to talk about divorce just a minute, and I'm just going to be real quick through here because I don't want to spend a whole lot. I, 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 could, I could go on this for a long time, too. What is the first one? I think you missed one. Marriage. Marriage is for life. Divorce is a lack of commitment. Divorce is saying, I don't know how to love. 
Divorce is saying, I'm selfish. The divorce is saying, I'm not a person of my word. Divorce is saying, I don't trust God. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. It has been said, Jesus is speaking again, that anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So let's just get it out there on the table right now. Uh, uh, divorce is sin. It's not the unforgivable sin. And it has been treated like that at times in the church. And the church needs to stand up for marriage. The church needs to stand up for right. But the church also needs to know how to love those who have failed and have given up, who have gotten selfish and gotten divorced and realize that divorce is not the unforgivable sin. God is a God of grace. And I am thankful, as many of you are, some of you are, that God is a God of second chances. Divorce is also saying, I have failed. I'm going to touch on one other area before we go on while we're talking about Commitment, and that is pornography. Pornography is breaking your commitment. The Bible says, forsaking all others, or your marriage vow said, forsaking all others, I promise to keep myself to you and to you only for as long as we both live. And when a guy starts looking at other women, or even women sometimes start looking at other men with lustful thoughts in their mind, they are breaking their marriage vows. That's why I don't approve of the suit, uh, uh, Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition. Because that is just nothing but pornography in a swimsuit enticing guys to break their vows. It has nothing to do with sports. So yes, us guys are going to look. You girls show, we're going to look. Unfortunately, we, we, we were, our, our magnets are programmed that way. But... We can learn to turn our heads. We can learn to look and say, okay, that's beautiful. Thank you. And go on. Or say, well, that's not like my wife. I'll go home and, and, and be faithful to her. We don't have to dwell on it. Marriage is, uh, go on. Yeah. Make it work. Marriage is in some countries uh, where there are mail order brides like Isaac and Rebecca. Remember? Abraham sent his servant up there to get a wife for Isaac. And he brought, the servant brought her home. Isaac didn't see her until here she is coming over the hill. And that's his wife. And what does the Bible say? He loved his wife. Never knew her, didn't know a thing about her. He just knew that she was kind of from the kinfolk way back up north where he'd never been. His father came down before he was ever born and had never been back to visit. And so here comes this woman he's never seen before in his life. And they made their marriage work. Was it rocky or was it smooth? Well, let's see. They had Jacob and Esau. And they had a little fuss over. She favored one. He favored the other. I'll bet they had their times of contention. But they were committed to each other. They didn't quit. They made their marriage work. And you see a lot of other cases through the Bible. And if you would look at some of those, you'd see a lot of those marriages were, well, I'll bet there were some fireworks in that home. More than once. I wonder if Abraham and, and Abram and Sarai uh, had a little fuss with what, you know, once, in a, once in a while before they were Abraham and Sarah. And, and maybe even after that they still, because sometimes we forget that love is not selfish. <clears throat> well, they made it work. The challenge is for us to quit trying to change your mate. And ask God to help you change you to be the person your mate, mate seeks and needs for you to be. My job is to see what I can do to love my wife more. There's a, a couple that kind of introduced this to us in California. They wake up every morning and say, okay, now what can I do to, today to show my spouse, my wife or my husband, that I love her or him more than they love me? And they play this game with each other every day. It's not an out loud, oh, I'm doing this because I love you. It's just the way they live their life. Wouldn't that be a great role model for us to follow? Might be, a, be an example to you. Let's go on to the next thing. Because I'm having too much fun here. I might draw all this too long. The second thing is, is communication. Let's go over to James chapter 3. I know. Thank you. 
James chapter 3, verse 10. Let's start with verse 9. With the tongue we both praise the Lord our Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. Brothers and sisters, this should not be. Communication is essential to nurturing one another. It is the only way your mate will know who you are and what to expect. You dialogue on what you don't like and what you do like. And without getting defensive or argumentative or accusative, the objective is to communicate, not to debate and conquer. Now, in order to have effective communication, it takes listening more than talking. In James chapter 1, verse 19... James chapter 1, verse 19, says, You believe there is one God? Good. See, I'm in James. Yeah, I'm in James. Okay, I just want to make sure. You believe in God? Good. Even the demons do that. And they shudder. That's not the one I was looking for. Maybe it was 219. Let's go over here. 119. 119, honey. 119 is what I wanted to read. Quick to listen. Swift well then, why am I not in James? I don't know. Yeah, be slow to speak, quick to listen, <coughs> and slow to get angry. That's the word I want to convey to you from that passage. We need to practice, and it takes practice. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm still working on it. But if we get it out here and we think about it, I need to be slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to get angry. That will help communication a lot. We also want to be seek to understand the other person more than we worry about being understood. If we would spend more time trying to understand why is this person saying this, why are they saying it with this tone of voice, why are they using these words, then we can tailor any response that's necessary more effectively back to them and be a little more communicative and less argumentative. I have found that what happens in most arguments is I am so selfish in trying to prove my point that I cannot hear a word you're saying. Yeah. And I've noticed too how many arguments are you saying the same thing I'm saying, but you're using this word, and I'm using that word, and because you're not using my word, you're wrong, and because I'm not using your word, you think I am stupid and dumb and a few other things that we don't want to get about in this conversation. Right. Come on. That's good. It's listening to meet the other's need and don't jump to conclusions. Respect the other's views. It's not necessary that you necessarily agree. There are some things that Sylvia and I talk about that, Glenn, this is not how I see it. That's not how I understand it. You and I differ. That doesn't mean our marriage is going to fail. It doesn't mean our marriage is going to end because we understand that we're coming from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different experiences. And so there are naturally going to be some different views. Leave the past in the past. This, number one, it's not fair. Uh, two, you wouldn't want to be treated that way. Now, there may be some things in the past that you might need to be aware of. If their spouse has cheated on you or, or gotten into drugs or, or, or something like that. But you don't want to necessarily bring it up in an argument or in a discussion. Uh, if it's serious enough, you observe it's still going on, you may have to uh, bring some sort of intervention or interruption into the relationship, counseling or, or something like that. But, but generally... The past comes up when you're trying to prove a point and you're arguing over things you shouldn't be arguing with. Leave the past in the past. Avoid the words always and never. Because nothing is always and nothing is never. Those are generally most of the time or a lot of the time or some of the time. I know it takes more syllables and more time to say some of the time. But that's probably a lot more accurate than always or never. A part of our communication is to praise, to bless, 
to encourage. That's the whole idea. To praise my spouse, if I praise her and, and, and show her that I really value her and trigger her, she's going to respond back accordingly and I'm going to like the response. Guys, you listening here? Gals, you listening? I've noticed a lot of times, and if you go to a Family Life's marriage conferences, they just had one in Tampa, or see, was it Tampa? Or, well, no, it was down in Daytona Beach, uh, I think it was Daytona Beach, just a few weeks ago. But they will, more than once, the husband and wife will go to the marriage conference, he sits over here, she sits over here. And our man, they're just about that far from a divorce. Some have even filed for divorce. And somehow they go to the marriage conference, and by the time the marriage conference is got, done, they're sitting right here, and the divorce stuff is all dropped. Because learning to communicate, and that's a lot of what these conferences do, is just kind of get you guys to communicate, talk to each other a little bit, in a more loving and, and considerate way, and you learn to praise and bless and encourage your spouse. Your spouse will learn to praise and bless and encourage you, and it will bless your marriage. Now, I'm going to hope this experiment works, I've got a little video clip here I want you to listen to for just a minute. Oh, oh, no, okay. This comment first. All marriage problems could be resolved without divorce if both parties would just communicate. This is why dating and doing things together, even after you're married, without the children. You know, hire a babysitter, get grandma to watch them for a little bit, or... or Trade time with a neighbor. You watch my kids tonight, and next week I'll watch your kids so you and your husband can go on a date. But get out with your spouse or without the kids. It helps to facilitate communication. Okay. Men communicate differently than women. Amen. <laughs> men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Get used to it. Yeah. This little video clip will help us learn something about how men and women communicate. So let's see if this works. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it. Like, literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. You do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop like, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. Achy, breaky. Achy, breaky. All my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. It's the nail. Achy, breaky. It's the nail. Uh, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Oh, if you would just. Don't. Did that about say it? <laughs> you can identify with that. Now here's something else that I think is very important. And that is to pray together for each other. You don't say, God, change my spouse and make her more beautiful or make her more nice to me and make her stop yelling at me. You say, God, bless my spouse. Fill her with your love. Help me to see how I can love her in a way that she wants to be loved. Pray for your spouse. For God to bless your spouse. And help you show them your love in a way that makes them feel loved. Uh, the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman and, and John Trent would be a good book to, to get. Yes. Learn your spouse's love language. Sylvia likes acts of service. Yep. And so when I help out in the kitchen or take care of the dishes or help plan a party or help her get ready for a party and help her clean up afterwards, <laughs> I had scoring brownie points. <laughs> you guys scored up brownie points and we're going to like you a whole lot. So, 
Five Love Languages, a, a very good book to look into. Okay, now let's go to the third one, and this is Compromise. Compromise in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Let's go over to Matthew. Oops. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 24 and 25. Verse, I'm going to start with verse 23. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. And then come and offer your gift. Now, you say, that's not crying in marriage. Oh, yes, it is. If you've got a spouse, and there are times when you've got a little, mm, I don't know if I agree with you on this, then getting together and learning to compromise and, and, and reconciling requires compromise. It takes a little bit of working together. And 24 hours a day, yes, okay. Now, I think somebody has said that's been married probably longer than all of us in this room, so I think they know what they're talking about. Pay attention. Luke chapter 12, verses 13, 14, and 15 say, Someone said to him, Father, tell my brother to re divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, because life does not consist in abundance of possessions. And sometimes marriages, the number one cause of divorce in marriage? Money. 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 Yeah. Money. Not sex. That's the number two cause of divorce in marriage. <laughs> number one cause is arguing over money problems. And you know what? If we would work at talking about these things, may not agree, as I said a little bit earlier, but we would at least understand where each other is coming from. How about solving? And then let's go over to chapter 14. And in 14 verses 31 through 33, the cost of being a disciple. Suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Oh, suppose a husband is about to go to war against his wife. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with $10,000 to oppose the one coming against him with $20,000? Or it's like one person I know said, he didn't want to cheat on his wife because he made so much money, she'd take him to the cleaners if they ever got divorced. <laughs> I don't know if he valued his money more than his wife or not. It almost makes you wonder or not. But they've been married 48 years, so uh, 40, 48 or 49. Uh, they're some out there. They're close to their 50th. So, hey, you know, the guy kept his marriage together. That, that's part of what counts. Okay. Uh, compromise is the 50-50 aspect of marriage. You've heard people say marriage is 50-50. Well, that's compromise. That's two different personalities blending into one relationship. And there is bound, there are bound to be irreconcilable differences. <laughs> Think about it. Sylvia grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Big city, grew up in a Catholic home uh, in, in, in that environment. I grew up in small town Kansas. <coughs> was taken to church from, from when I was, well, she was taken to church when she was this size too. We both went to church. She went to Catholic church. I grew up in Christian church. And... Uh, her life took her this way, and my life took me that way, and somewhere in California, we got to meet, and we got to know one another, and like I said, I really liked what I did see. She had the pretty brown eyes, and she looked a lot at me. And, uh, and I said, who could I fix him up with? Yeah, she was trying to fix me up with somebody else. I was trying to see who in this room do I want to meet. I won. We both won. But uh, talk about differences? Yeah. Uh, I, I can just uh, think of, uh, well, every one of you. How many of you grew up in the same town? Anybody of you, you with your spouse? <laughs> Did you grow up in the same town with your spouse? Not a one. You know that every town has its own personality. How many of you grew up in a big city? Uh, a couple. How many grew up in small towns? How about many cities? A few others. Oh, I see now. now here's the, here's the, the wife saying the big city. Here's the husband saying the small town. <laughs> Irreconcilable differences. I can beat this horse to death. I better go on. But the bottom line is that if you expect to agree with your spouse on all areas, you're not being realistic. 
So, Sylvia and I came from different backgrounds. Yeah, we have irreconcilable differences. Compromise can only happen through commitment, along with communication and a willingness to consider the other person's feelings. So, quit being selfish. I've, we, we've taken times when we have, uh, call me communication, uh, willingness to consider the other person's feelings. Quit being so selfish. I've looked at my own life, what was right and what was wrong in my marriage relationship, and I can tell you there were some times when I was really, ooh, wow, ah, selfish. Ooh, that's bad. Because I wasn't getting what I wanted, and I just couldn't get inside my intelligence to look at the other from the other person's point of view. If I could have done that, life would have been a whole lot different. I've learned. I'm still working on it. Sometimes I have to, wait a see now, am I being a little selfish here, or do I need to learn to listen and uh, communicate and compromise? And we said in communication, it requires listening to your spouse and considering their point of view, considering their feelings. Why is Sylvia saying this to me the way she's saying it to me? There may be a perfectly rational, reasonable, but once I understand it, may not change the issue, but at least it allows me to respond in a way that's a little more compassionate. And, and that would not be a bad idea. You see, it's not about you. It's not, it, it is not loving when you demand your way and are unwilling to consider your spouse's feelings or point of view. So quit being so selfish. Learn to compromise. Now there's one more. I was talking with uh, some friends last night. Uh, they've just recently moved into our neighborhood. We were kind of hoping we could invite them to church, but we couldn't. Then we said, I'm going to be preaching tomorrow on the four C's of a successful marriage. And she said, well, let's see now. Uh, um, uh, communicate. I said, that's the second one. Oh, well, well, Christ. No, I said, that's the fourth one. <laughs> and she said, well, what's the first one? I said, commitment. And the... Uh, uh, the fourth, third one is compromise. Now, the reason I say that before I say, don't look at it. Yeah, I'm going to say that before I go on. I see a lot of Christians that believe they believe in Christ, but their marriages aren't reflecting it. So, Christ, as much as I, if you're sincerely committed to Christ, yes, Christ would be the most important foundation of your whole marriage thing. But I see a lot of non-Christians that are committed to one another and they're making their marriages work even though they don't understand the need for Jesus Christ in their lives. So as much as I want to make Christ number one, and I believe He is, commitment is number one. Because if you've got commitment to each other as husband and wife, you will learn to compromise and uh, uh, communicate and compromise. Let's look at Luke chapter 16, uh, verse 16 real quick. Luke chapter 16 verse 16 through 18. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time the good news of the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of the pen to drop out of the law. Now, Jesus kind of changed the subject here. We were in this and getting to know Jesus just a couple of weeks ago. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And the man who divorced his wife commits, marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Why did Jesus break into that, that previous comment and say that to this crowd? Evidently, uh, too many of them were getting divorced. In fact, if you join us for getting to know Jesus, you will learn that one of the characteristics about Pharisees was they didn't think that they were a proper good Pharisee until they divorced their first wife and married somebody else. Oh, is there a problem with that? So that's why Jesus made the comments he did in, that we read earlier in Matthew 19. And then in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And from now on, you will do, you do know Him, and you have seen Him. So Jesus is the most important. Because 
if you have Jesus, He is the cement, cement that changes us to commit to one another and to communicate and to accept compromise. If Jesus is active in your life and you really care about Him, you will not want to do anything that would hurt your spouse because that would be unloving to your spouse. That would be unloving to Jesus. You will want to communicate and develop your communication skills. My dear, what did you say? Okay, I understand that you said. And you know, I didn't say this earlier, but if, if you're having a discussion with your spouse, a lot of times it's really helpful if you will reiterate back what they said to you. Right. You said you didn't like me not taking out the trash. Is that what you said? And they will say, yes, that's what I said. Maybe. And it, well, maybe. <laughs> it helps to diffuse the argument if they understand that you're listening enough to them to repeat back what they said. And that opens the door for them to listen to you. Yep. A lot of times, if one spouse will decide, I am going to love my wife or love my husband like God wants me to, the other spouse will realize they're not treating me the way they were treating me. And they'll decide that I need to be more loving back. And a marriage can be strengthened and built on that foundation of Christ instead of being splintered and blown apart. And, and, and I, I didn't talk about in, in divorce that divorce hurts family. It hurts friends. Children are really affected by divorce no matter how old they are when the divorce occurs. And parents... Oh dear, we used to love this person and now our child has divorced this person and we can't love them anymore. We can't be their parents, friends anymore and all this. And can't see the grandkids anymore. Aunts and uncles are affected. Divorce really, really messes things up. And those of you that have been there can verify that. If you love Jesus, you will love your mate. Period. For better, for worse, in sickness and in health. Some of you have been nursing your spouse through sickness right now because that's the way life has taken you. But you're committed. You're going to make that marriage work for richer, for poorer. Again, you may not have $2 to go buy a, a, an ice cream cone over there at the, your favorite ice cream cone store, but you've got each other. Sylvia will say to me many a time, Glenn, have you got everything? And I say, well, I've got Jesus, I've got you, what else do I need? <laughs> and so I left this morning and left the thumb drive with all the That's PowerPoint right. at home and had to go back home and get it. That's right. Uh -oh. Fortunately, you're four miles down the road instead of 40. <laughs> yes, fortunately, it was only four and a half miles instead of 40. So we were able to get that done. Um, if you love Jesus, you will want to obey. Period. If you love Jesus, you will want to obey. If you don't care about obeying Jesus, then you don't love Him very much. That's period. And you're going to want to stand before God someday and say, God, please love me and let me in. And He's going to say, well, there's only going to be one question on the final. Who's Jesus? That's right. Ah, He's just some good moral teacher, but I didn't love Him very much. What do you think God's going to say about that? If you love Jesus, you're going to want to be the most loving person your spouse could ever desire to have. So, this is what it is. You can make your, choose to make your marriage work. You begin by committing your life to Jesus Christ. You share your response to make your marriage work with your spouse. You know, not a bad idea to just tell your spouse uh, that you're going to make that marriage work. I told Sylvia on the day that I proposed to her, uh, I think it was August 30th, 1995, if I remember the dates right, if divorce is an option, marriage is not. If divorce is not an option, marriage is. So we've decided that question already. All we got to do is keep working on what I've just shared with you. Commitment, communication, compromise, and Christ. And we will have a lasting marriage, and you can too. So you continue by studying and obeying Jesus' life and teachings. We're going to have 